So thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming, uh, people in person, as well as uh, everybody who is uh, in the live stream. Um, for those I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health. And on behalf of our school, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's Public Health Forum, which is our last of the calendar year. Uh, just by way of a little bit of framing. So in 2015, then President Obama spoke of the promise of precision medicine. He hailed its potential to deliver, quote, the right treatments at the right time, every time to the right person. His enthusiasm has been broadly shared. Precision medicine is now one of the most significant movements in science in this country and worldwide. It has attracted substantial investment, and its approaches have opened uh, the door to new therapies and new understandings of disease. Now, on a personal note, I've written a bit about this topic, and what the angle that I have been interested in is trying to identify opportunities within the precision medicine movement to advance the goals of public health. I think the challenge of public health really is balancing our investment in precision medicine with investment in the core social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. And I think this is especially true of the United States, where we spend more on health than any of our peer countries. So I'm particularly excited about today's topic, and I'm particularly excited to learn more about this topic from today's speaker, who really is one of the best persons in the world to talk about this. Donna Arnett is Dean of the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. She's a NIH-funded researcher for more than two decades. Dean Arnett studies genes that relate to hypertensive disorders and organ damage that result from hypertension. She's published more than 450 papers and two books. Before she took her current position at the University of Kentucky, she was the Associate Dean and Chair of the Epidemiology Department at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. She's, she's also a former president of the American Heart Association, and she was an invited guest when President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative. On a personal note, Dean Arnett and I have known each other for many years in the epidemiology community, and I have always enjoyed our interactions and learned very much from Donna. Donna. Well, thank you for that wonderful invitation, and it's an honor to be here and to speak today about precision medicine. And I'm going to frame it mostly in the context of precision medicine because we are yet to find precision public health. So today I'm going to be talking about what it is, what is precision public health, and what's its potential. Um, types of genetic testing that are used in precision public health or medicine, um, and then a, a, a bit about what I call equipoise. So finding that balance between managing population risk and precision medicine and precision public health. And then finally, moving forward into the future and what would be the barriers and facilitators of precision public health into actual practice. So let's start with what it is and what's its potential. So this is an article that was published in JAMA in 2001 by our current NIH director, Francis Collins, which says that genetics is moving into the medical mainstream. Now that's 2001. And he says the, the discovery of genetic causes of common diseases is already beginning to have an impact on primary care medicine. This trend will undoubtedly accelerate in the near future. Now this is 2001. And to my knowledge, there was absolutely zero genetic testing going on in primary care at that time. But Francis has always been an enthusiastic advocate of this whole field. Thankfully, we started to realize with the completion of the ENCODE project um, in 2011 that it's not simple. DNA sequence is not just a, it, the sequence may be simple, but interpretation of all of the kinds of variants and types of variants and all of the empty space in the genome between, D, between genes is complicated. And then we move ahead to 2015 where this field of what was then called personalized medicine really took hold and was gaining momentum in the common press. So this is an article in Time with a, a baby um, saying, do you want to know my future? And it has all of these diseases listed. Um, and then the whole uh, genome journal devoted to what is personalized medicine. So it's a field that's gained tremendous traction. So what does it do? So precision public health or medicine is an approach to disease treatment that seeks to maximize effectiveness by taking into account the individual variability in genes and the environment and lifestyle. There are a number of, act of, of adjectives that have been used, like preventive, predictive, personalized, and participatory, and these have been emphasized in the recent Precision Medicine Initiative. So there are various domains, and I'm going to cover some of them today, about what public health or medicine and precision medicine means. So there's a place, definitely, for identifying rare disease risk. So what are the causative genes that cause Mendelian disorders? 
Can we identify for rare diseases early prediction of disease so if there is an intervention, we could intervene early and, and stop the, the long-term consequences of that genetic mutation? Uh, we do that now, actually, in infant screening with PKU, where we test for PKU and we, we alter the diet of children so they don't become effective. We can do preconception or, or um, screening as well. In the area of pharmacogenetics, we could utilize precision medicine to risk stratify particular individuals who may benefit better from one particular drug given their genetic background. We could look at drug efficacy and dosing for, for particular agents, and we could look at side effect prediction. And in, in my field in cardiovascular, that's probably the area that has the, the most potential. And then there's this whole big can of worms called common disease risk. And I think that's where we in epidemiology, where we're really focused on diseases that occur frequently in population, sit. And that's where we have the most work to do. So precision medicine, precision public health will be evaluating how we risk predict, how we stratify, and identifying patients or populations to focus on early behavior change for risk reduction. So those are the various domains within precision medicine public health. Now, I got into this field, interestingly, when I worked as a clinical research nurse, uh, and I'll, I'll claim the year, 1986, when I started working with patients, and I was working in drug studies treating hypertensives. And what I found is that there was tremendous variability in individuals' responses to drugs. And then it was known as this 30-30-30 rule. About 30% of patients would respond to an antihypertensive, about a third would have an adverse effect, and about a third would have no effect at all. And so we really had to sort of play hit and miss with the different agents uh, to see what worked. Well, this is not a problem unique to antihypertensive agents. If you look at this slide, um, antidepressants have a 38% failure rate. Asthma drugs have a 40% failure rate. Um, and even cancer drugs, where we're really um, maximizing dose to try to get the biggest effect to kill cancer cells, we have a 75% failure rate. So if we could identify treatments a priori before we start, then we may be able to improve efficacy uh, and long-term outcomes. So this whole concept of variation is not a new one. Uh, this is Sir William Osler, who's quoted way back in the day, that variability is the law of life. So we do expect this kind of variability. As no two faces are the same, so no two bodies are alike, no two individuals react and behave alike under the abnormal conditions which we know as disease. And so the real heart of pharmacogenetics and precision medicine, or public health um, uh, precision, is thinking through how we treat. In, in all of our interventions, both on the medicine side, on the public health side, we are treating to the mean effect, right? Well, these are two grown men who are very different in almost every aspect. Um, one's a jockey, one's a basketball player. And so how well would giving a standard dose of a drug work for these two individuals? So we have to think beyond just the mean. And here's, I'm going to present some interesting data from my own work that look at the variability of response to uh, three different categories of drugs. Now, this is a study, uh, one of my early R01s that was ancillary to the all hat study, which was at that point the largest antihypertensive drug trial ever conducted in over 40,000 individuals. This slide represents the 3,000 individuals who had never been on an antihypertensive agent before they came in and were randomized to one of four treatments. So what you'll notice here is that there is a, a, a natural bell-shaped curve for each of these treatments for doxazosin, chlorthalidone, amlodipine, or lisinopril, four different classes of agents used to treat blood pressure. And in each case, you could have a great response, you could have no response or an increase, um, or absolute no change in blood pressure. So that 30-30-30 rule I quoted earlier, you can see happens here in every agent. It's not limited to blood pressure. This is warfarin dose variability, where we find a 30-fold variability across individuals in what they require for that narrow therapeutic range needed for warfarin treatment. Some people respond with just one milligram, some people um, 17 to 18 milligrams of warfarin per day in order to reach that therapeutic level. 
And these are um, data from my own study called the Genetics of Lipid Lowering Diet Network, where we intervened with phenofibrate in healthy individuals and looked at their triglyceride change um, after three weeks of treatment. And you see some people have a dramatic response, minus 220 to triglycerides, and some people actually had increases in triglyceride levels after treatment. So we know at the basis there's something contributing to this variability. We also know from just good old-fashioned family history studies that genetics have a very profound effect on heart disease. And these are old data from the Utah Family Tree Study. And it's a complicated slide, so let me explain it a bit. So this is um, affected with coronary heart disease um, by number affected in a family, either one or two or more. And in particular, we were evaluating early onset disease because there, there's the theory that the earlier onset diseases are more likely to be genetically determined. So what you find is that if you are um, less than, you've had two affected relatives less than 55 years of age with coronary disease, it's not a very large portion of the population, but you have really profound risks for CHD in, in your family with nearly a 13-fold increased risk. And if you look at the distribution, as I said, there are very few who have um, that kind of risk. This is the number of families that, um, these are family risk scores that are based on age standardized rates and how many events have occurred in a family. Um, and you see most families, about 90% of families are in this very low risk level, but about um, 75 events occur in these uh, family risk scores greater than one, which means at least one person in the family affected at an early age. So something is driving that familiality of coronary heart disease. So let's switch gears now that I've justified why we care about precision medicine and, and the genetics of cardiovascular disease to the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative. So Sa Sandro already broke, spilled the beans that I got to uh, be at the announcement of the White House uh, Precision Medicine, that little blonde head. There is mine, right behind Francis Collins. I actually got to shake the president's hand. You can't see him very well, but it was a highlight of my, of my history as an American Heart Association president. So what is this Precision Medicine Initiative? Uh, it called for a very large amount of funding in 2016 to support this initiative. And it was divided into two big buckets. Uh, two thirds of it were, was devoted to recruiting a cohort of a million participants, and another 70 million was allocated specifically to the NCI, National Cancer Institute, for cancer genomics. So that is the initiative, and it began in 2016. And the reason there was such a focus on cancer is that um, they really wanted to look at I told you about the failure rate of cancer drugs. So really, they wanted to accelerate the design and testing of effective treatments in the cancer domain, expand those genetically-based clinical cancer, clinical cancer trials, and establish a national cancer knowledge network to guide treatment decisions. And I have to say, in the precision medicine space, cancer genomics is out there in front. So this is where um, the, these are a list of milestones and, and where we are now. So I told you that they, the initiative was funded in July of 2016. Uh, they went through a name change from the Precision Medicine Cohort to the All of Us. Um, so this, this large one million person study is called now the All of Us Research Program. And that name change was really reflective of one of the core values of the initiative, which is to represent all um, Americans in all different kinds of subgroups of Americans. So in, in June of 2017, we started beta testing, um, and the initial protocol was released in August, um, and they launched the genomics working group. And I hear the beta testing is going well, and it's expected to start enrollment uh, in the spring for those who want to volunteer. So participation will reflect the rich diversity of the US. That's why it was changed to an all of us. It's a different approach to research where you as a participant are going to be a partner in the research. So the idea is that you will upload your own data from your Fitbit or your um, diet into your uh, uh, electronic record um, and really participate in the research itself. You will have access to your information as a participant um, and your data will be accessed broadly for research purposes um, theoretically around the world. 
Um, there, of course, will be security and privacy concerns, um, and those are being addressed now uh, by the program. And the, the thought behind this and, and Francis Collins' vision is that this is going to be a catalyst for how, a change in how we do uh, research, not only in genetics, but in, in all of medicine and public health. So that's justification. That's what the precision medicine cohort is. So I'd like to take a moment now to talk to you about what are the various things that you can test now in the precision medicine, precision public health space. Let me just start by saying all of this work was truly enabled by the Human Genome Project. So this project began uh, in the 80s, um, concluded in the 1990s, more than 15 years ago, and that Human Genome Project sought to identify all 22,000 genes in the human genome and to sequence the two billion bases that are part of the human genome, and it was accomplished. So what that project enabled um, was us to identify the variants that are inherited in a Mendelian fashion through families. So when I started my research career in 1994, when we were doing genetic epidemiology at that point, we had to execute all of our research in families. So we had to look at how DNA was transmitted through a family using genetic markers throughout the genome to look at shared regions of the genome that correlated with the disease status in those families. So this is an example of a Mendelian inheritance where you have a defective allele in mom and a defective allele in dad, and you can predict through probability that one in four of those children would, would be affected because of that recessive inheritance. And there were many genes that had been discovered using this method. And one of the most uh, well-known genes is genes that cause familial breast cancer. So this was discovered in the 1990s. About 12% of women will develop breast cancer over the course of their lives. About, uh, amongst familial breast cancer cases, about 2% have a, a known cause. And if the two major genes that have been identified with, with breast cancer are called um, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, both located on chromosome 17 and chromosome 13, and they account for about 60% of the cases BRAC1 and about 45% in BRAC2 of those who carry that mutation will develop breast cancer. So that lets, opens up many opportunities then for prevention. Now the thing about, about those who um, are new to genetics is Having a mutation is not a simple test. So the BRAC1 and BRAC2 genetic testing requires sequencing. So going through the entire gene and identifying all of the sequence, sequences in that gene. So this is the, the gene here. The dark blue lines are the protein coding parts of the gene. And all of these red dots are where mutations have been identified. So that's the BRAC1 gene, this is BRAC2. So you can see that we have, to, we have to sequence a large portion of the gene to identify unique mutations that are unique to that individual patient. And that's how that work is done. And I've talked about using pre predictive medicine for prevention, and one of the very famous cases of BRAC1 uh, is Angelina Jolie, who, whose mother died of breast cancer and who is a carrier for BRAC1 and elected to have um, a double mastectomy back in 2015. So I am a cardiovascular epidemiologist and have had a longstanding interest in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's another disease where you have a, a typical Mendelian inheritance, and there are many genes that have been identified. Um, they commonly are an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance mode, and I listed some of those genes, all of these genes, are products that form muscle cell structures called sarcomeres, um, and they're the basic units of muscular contraction. And across these genes, there have been more than 1,500 different mutations identified. Now, the good thing is in terms of screening, so if you have a family member who comes in with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there, you, you may want to know if other family members are affected with that variant. And there are many off-the-shelf tests now that are available that can utilize those mutations to test family members. 
So this is just one uh, panel that's been identified. Another one is by gene diagnosis uh, for heart hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So these are currently available um, and very useful in those single gene Mendelian disorder traits that have a known inheritance. Well, I said when I started my research career, we had to study families because you, you could not identify genes in unrelated individuals because you had to rely on the genetic segments traveling through families and correlating with the disease status in that family. In 2005 or so, there was a rapid changeover in the entire field of genetic epidemiology. And that was the advent of something called the genome-wide association study. It's hard to believe that this is just probably a decade ago that this technology was first implemented in epidemiologic studies. So the way that it works is they are um, typically chip-based methodology, and they take an array of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. That means one base pair is variable in a gene and it aggregates them and can test up to one to two million of these single nucleotide polymorphisms in one test. They're good because they cover the entire genome, and so you can ask questions along a whole genome, is there a particular single nucleotide polymorphism, I'm gonna call them SNPs from now on, that's associated with a particular disease. Now, believe it or not, 2007, this was named by Science Magazine of the, as the breakthrough of the year. And what's really interesting is it took off. So if you look at this slide, and this is from April 2016, I haven't updated it since. Each one of these dots represents a genetic association finding for some phenotype and some SNP on each of these chromosomes. So what you see is nearly every gene, every part of every chromosome, has some significant association with some trait. So it's been a very uh, well-utilized and powerful method for identifying variants, I won't say genes, but variants associated with disease. And it's been powerful, but it does require very large sample sizes. So you know, my interest has been in hypertension, and the target organ damage from hypertension. This was the, done in 2011, the largest study ever done for systolic blood pressure. And what's really interesting is that um, there were about 30 some odd genes that were identified. 22 of them had never been suspected before in terms of hypertension causation. So the whole theory and practice behind genome-wide association studies is identifying genes that we wouldn't think of in this agnostic hypothesis generating way that may correlate with hypertension that could open new pathways for new treatments or new diagnostics. Now, I told you it took 200,000 people to find, that, find those findings for hypertension. Why did it take so many? Well, hypertension is a really complex disease. You know, we have to maintain blood pressure when we sit, when we stand, when we lie down and stand up. So there's a lot of, of varying different pathways that are all contributing to blood pressure. So it's a multigenic uh, regulation, many genes, many pathways regulating blood pressure. Now switch to warfarin. Warfarin is, uh, is used to, to uh, treat clotting abnormalities. And so this was a, a genome-wide association study done with warfarin on a very small sample size of, of just a few hundred individuals. And they found within that sample size a very potent uh, finding for a genome-wide significance. So, so for those of you who've never seen, these are called Manhattan plots. So each of these uh, bars represents a, a chromosome from 1 to 22, and there's an X chromosome. And what you find is these are the um, inverse of the log of the p-value. So the taller the spike, the more statistically significant a finding is. Uh, and this line here indicates where you reach genome-wide significance after you've adjusted for all of the tests that you've done um, statistically. And so what we found, uh, my colleagues found, is that the vitamin K receptor gene was very potent at predicting warfarin response. That would make sense, right, because the pathway is working on VCOR. So the balance here in genome-wide association studies is a balance between effect size 
um, and, and sample size. Now, there are many direct-to-consumer uh, tests that use these GWAS-like assays. Probably the most familiar one to you that's mostly in the media is the 23andMe test. I think you could order your ancestry for $49 over Thanksgiving. Um, so it's being used uh, by a lot of people, not only for ancestry, but for diseases. So about six years ago, the field moved again. So I told you just, you know, in 2007, GWAS became the thing to do. Um, and about five, six years ago, we moved to something called exome sequencing. There was a revolution in the way that we could sequence individuals that was cost effective. So you could sequence in the exome, the protein coding part of a, an individual's DNA, for about five to $800 a person. So whole exome sequencing doesn't just take those individual single nucleotide polymorphisms. It takes all of the, the coding region of the genome, of the genes in the genome, and gives actual sequence data. And so there have been a, a, a many, many studies that are emerging now using the whole exome sequencing path, path platform. This is an example of clinical whole exome sequencing for Mendelian disorders. Um, and this paper concluded that whole exome sequencing identified a genetic variant in about 25% of patients who were referred for a genetic condition. So this has been a very powerful method for people that have undiagnosed diseases um, to identify what, what protein is being defective and affected by a mutation in a gene. Now, <clears throat> there are some places in the U.S. that are utilizing this approach. This is a slide from Mayo, who's created an individualized um, medicine clinic for patient care and is utilizing these whole exome um, services to identify those misdiagnosed or non-diagnosed diseases. Now, more recently, uh, three years ago, the field has changed again. So the exome represents about 1% of the genome. Now the field has moved to whole genome sequencing. So every base pair of the three billion or so base pairs we have in our, in our DNA is now being sequenced. And there's a very large program I'm involved with, uh, funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute called TopMed uh, Precision Medicine, where we are, as a group of about 39 studies, whole genome sequencing 140,000 genomes. And the reason why the whole genome has moved forward is that um, the ENCODE project, where I told you that DNA was more complicated than just sequences, identified that we really don't understand all of the regions between exons, between the protein coding parts of the genome and the genes, and that they likely have some kind of regulatory function. And so we've moved into this whole area, and we, we believe that this whole genome sequencing is going to increase our diagnostic rate um, about 25% more than just exome sequencing alone. And now the field is moving again. So I said about three years ago we moved to this whole genome sequencing, and now we're, we've moved into this field of other omics. So it's going, to, it's going to become even more complicated. So we're now moving, so if the genome is uh, your DNA, the transcriptome is measuring your RNA, and that's a, a, an area of, of rapid growth. Um, you care about proteins that are, that are encoded by that RNA and the proteome and metabolomics, looking at sugars, nucleotides, amino acids, and lipids is the new rage right now. Um, and all of those are going to be linked in a multi-omics way uh, to all of the phenotypes. So this is expensive business that we're, we're into. So each genome of those 140,000 genomes being sequenced by NHLBI is $1,000 a person, so that's a lot of money. And that's just the genome sequencing piece of it. It's not the analysis piece, which, if funded properly, would be about the same amount of money. So here I am. I am a public health person, you know, and I'm also a scientist. You know, I love, like, the novelty and the excitement and the pushing the envelope of what we can do in terms of understanding genetics. But as a public health practitioner, I also have to think through what is the right balance between what we're doing on this space of discovery for 
biological causes of diseases and the long-term implications of that on treatment and prevention and where we are right now in our public's health. So I wrote an article um, recently about this precision medicine and public health. So our traditional public health approach is, is really to, to just put out um, an intervention into a population. I'll use an example of a high salt, uh, low salt diet and look at how people respond. And so you would expect um, those who are untreated to um, have no intervention effect, um, and you would have that bell-shaped curve of the treatment that I showed you earlier with antihypertensive therapies, where about 30% respond, 30 did not respond. So in the personalized public health, we could think through a low-salt um, intervention but we know from trials like the treatment of hypertension prevention that there are variants in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that predict that only about one in six people will respond based on genotype to a low salt diet. So we could pick out those individuals based on their genotype and target the low salt diet just to those individuals and really tighten up that distribution of response. So that's theory. But as I've said, we have a very sick population, and right now in public health, in terms of public health precision public health, we have very few variants with large enough effects to really implement things on population scale, not to mention the fact that it's hard to measure genetics right now at a population scale. So this is looking at the health of the US, and I told you I was very worried as a public health practitioner about where we are and finding this point of equipoise. So about one in four of our population has arthritis. I'll just point out some of the, the really big ones. About one in five have depression. One in 10 have diabetes. Uh, one in five report some disability. If you combine overweight and obesity, it's now 70% of our population. About 10% have asthma. Uh, and about 7% have COPD. So we have a lot of physical um, diseases in our populations. So my question is, what can we do right now? You know, our genome has evolved over many generations, but our environment has really evolved rapidly over just a few generations. So let's look at the area of physical activity. So, you know, probably 2,000 generations ago, we had to be physically active to survive, right? We had to, we had to go out and collect our food or hunt our food. Uh, we had to run away from the woolly mammoth or the saber-toothed tiger to survive. We had to walk, go down to the river to get our water. You know, there was a lot of physical activity. In fact, in the Paleolithic period, it's estimated that we walked 15 um, miles per day. Okay, so we're, we're in an area of high physical activity. And then just think about this. It, this is early 1900s, right? We got cars, and then shortly thereafter, we got planes. And this is now what we've evolved to. So we're sitting most of the time at a computer or on our sofa or in our cars at traffic. <laughs> and that's how we spend the majority of our time. So if we're really trying hard, we may wear our Fitbit, we may get our 10,000 steps a day, we may have a standing desk, but we're set up really to be physically inactive. So that's one of the environmental factors of worry, but the other one is how much our food has changed just in the past 100 years. So one of the interesting phenomena from a diet perspective is mass food production did not occur until post-World War II. And even then, it was much healthier than now. So now we've moved from a, a pretty much whole foods kind of diet where we cooked at home um, and had whole foods to this kind of fast food processed kind of lifestyle um, to eating on the run. So from a genetics perspective, we have evolved over about 8,000 generations as humans, 8,000. And in most of that 8,000 generations, we were highly physically active. We ate a mostly vegetarian diet except when we could kill something to, to eat. And we didn't smoke, and we didn't have air pollution, we didn't have water pollution. And now in just four generations, 
four generations, we've rapidly changed this environment. So that piece of equipoise is that it's not, we, we can't ignore the genome because certainly it evolved over those 8,000 years and we know from, from the data I showed you earlier that has profound effect on, on, on many of our cardiovascular traits that I'm interested in. But we have to look at how it interacts with the environment because in those 8,000 generations, for the most part, our environment didn't change, nor did our genome. But our environment has changed profoundly in just four generations. Now, I said I really love science, and I do, and I really love public health and finding that right balance. The reason we as public health practitioners cannot ignore precision public health is that the cart is out before the horse. No matter what we want to do in terms of public health, this field has moved and evolved and is moving and evolving faster than we can keep up with it. So this looks at the market size for different areas of personalized medicine from 2009 to 2015. In just six years, it went from a $230 billion business to a $400 billion business. And that's in the forms of, of esoteric tests and labs and therapeutics to personalized Medicare, medi Medicare, medical care to nutrition and wellness. So we have to not bury our heads in the sand. We have to stay up to date with where this field is going. So of course, you know, being a genetic epidemiologist, I had to do the 23andMe, right? So this is my personal report. So here I am. I think we all knew this. I'm 98.9% .9 European. Probably didn't surprise anyone, although I have to say that there's this long-standing history that I had a great-great-grandmother who was an, uh, a Cherokee Indian. There is absolutely no Cherokee Indian in any of my DNA history. The other thing I learned that I already knew is that my muscle composition indicates that I'm unlikely to be a sprinter. <laughs> I already knew this, because for those of you who don't know me, I train dogs in dog agility, and I run with them. Uh, and my coach one day said, can you run any faster? And I said, really, I'm running as fast as I can. She said, I want you to do it again, and I want you to pretend like a bear is chasing you. So I go back on the course, and I run as fast as I can like a bear is chasing me. And I turn, and I said, OK, was I faster? And she said, no. I knew I wasn't a sprinter. But all of these different, air, different companies are, are, are emerging to help you as the consumer of 23andMe understand your genetic results. So one of these companies is called Prometheus. So according to Prometheus, who scours the literature and evaluates this, the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are on these, the 23andMe chip, identified that I have 371 bad alleles. And then it gives you a lengthy report about what they are. Um, now this is my next report. And so luckily, I have something called the warrior gene, and I'm a double, I'm a homozygote for this warrior gene, which means I can tolerate pain a little better, something else I already knew about myself. Then there's another company called Pure Genomics Reports and Products. Now, the interesting thing about this company is it goes through all of your metabolic genes. So these are things that regulate homocysteine and vitamin B12 and that kind of thing. Um, and for a mere $100 a bottle, they will say, because I'm a, 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 double homo, a homozygote for this FUT2 gene and the MTRR gene, that they'll, for $100, send me special methylcobalamin that fixes my genetic mutation and probiotics. So, of course, I bought them, right? So my point is that we have to stay abreast of what's happening in this field. Um, to find the right balance. Now, I'm an evidence-based scientist. I love science. I want to create evidence base. And what's challenging about the, this field in particular, so I've said the cart is out ahead of the horse. We're doing all of this genetic testing. People are going and getting their own genetic testing done. We have no evidence about the utility of that if we're trying to create precision public health or precision medicine initiatives. So there are 10 things that we're going to have to do 
as barriers and facilitators to make sure we can move this field into practice. So the first is in linking data. So think about the complexity. If I were to take that 23andMe report as just one example and try to link it into my um, electronic medical record, you know, I would have to look and integrate all kinds of other data that would help interpret that genetic test. So daily events, and this is what the, pers the precision medicine cohort's attempting to do, the all of us cohort, is to have people log in and talk about their activities of daily living. We'd also have to have accuracy, and this is a big concern in the whole space, particularly of exome and whole genome sequencing. We need to have accuracy of and reproducibility of the data that we're gathering. And it's not just the phenotypic data. So just think through. Most of this work is going to be done in an electronic medical record. Think through all of the errors that happen in electronic medical records and in diagnostics that we derive from those kinds of electronic medical records. On the flip side, people think that genetics are accurate. Well, guess what? About one in four of the genetic variants identified on whole genome or exome sequencing do not reproduce in a CLIA-certified lab, about one in four. So there's a lot of measurement error in both directions that we have to worry about. There are blurred boundaries between what's research and what's clinical, um, and it presents a whole host of methodologic and eth ethical problems beyond just identity protection, but consent and data sharing. There's the um, whole issue of how large these data sets are. So for a single gene, a single gene is on average about 2,700 nucleotides or bases. The whole genome data that we're collecting now is 3 billion bases. So it's terabytes and terabytes of data. How can health systems, if we want to implement this either in, in public health or medicine, how can they accommodate that kind of omic data um, it's costly to store, and how do we link it to the things that are going to be important from an environmental perspective, such as smoking or diet or physical activity? Then there's the whole issue on perpetual updating. So say you have, uh, you have your 23andMe results in your EMR, and you come in and you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. How do you update that and link that to see if there's anything new that's important in terms of that information? So, so when do you say stop in terms of analysis once you have all of this data present in your medical record? And then there's the whole issue in terms of just simple raw computational power, how we're going to store these data, how you retrieve them. I can tell you the retrieval of the whole genome sequence data is not easy, and how do we create decision support tools that uh, uh, that support this work, and all of these areas are, are challenging. And then affordability. So there's the cost versus the benefit. Um, there's the threat of even further increasing the, the ethnic disparities that we see now, because these tests are most likely going to be unaffordable to the majority of patients. And then representation. How do we assure that we have racial, ethnic, social, and cultural diversity? And if we assure that, then it adds, from a genetics perspective and analysis perspective, more challenge analytically. So it's, it's, it's both uh, a double-edged sword. And then in terms of, of another challenge is favorable support. So right now, precision medicine, precision public health sounds sexy, and people are jumping onto it, um, but if we, if we don't have favorable consensus, we won't be able to implement this into the future. And then in terms of education, we don't yet have a workforce that understands genetic testing that could implement based on a genetic test, and so we'd have to educate our workforce as well. So in summary, Precision Public Health, I've talked about what it is and what's its potential. We talked about the various different types of genetic testing from single gene disorders that we sequence to genome-wide association uh, disc chips that we utilize and whole genome and exome sequencing. We've talked about equipoise and how do we find that balance between investing in scientific discoveries and treating the diseases that are so prevalent in our population now. 
especially given that these diseases have occurred with just four generations of rapid changes in the environments in which we live. And then finally, I've reviewed the barriers and facilitators. So this is a field that's not going away. These are just a few of the headlines um, in indicating where all uh, precision medicine resides. This was one of my favorites. Precision Medicine Conference was lambasted for heavily white male panels. We pointed that out. So this was um, a, a recent article that came out in April of uh, 2016. And it was in Scientific American. It was called The Paradox of Precision Medicine. So you may recall that when the president launched his State of the Union address where he brought forward this concept of precision medicine, he had lauded the effect that of finding a cystic fibrosis um, variant that led to a treatment that cured the boy that he brought with him to the, to the um, State of the Union from his cystic fibrosis. What you don't know is that that gene identification and time to treatment took over 20 years. It only treats 5% of all cystic fibrosis patients. It costs $130,000 a year. So that's kind of the flip side of this precision medicine initiative. So this article says, precision medicine sounds like an inarguably good thing. It begins with the observation that individuals vary in their genetic makeup and that their diseases and responses to medications differ as a result. It then aims to find the right drug for the right patient at the right time, every time. This notion certainly has its supporters among medical experts, but for every one of them, there is another who thinks that efforts to achieve precision medicine are a waste of time and money. You may have a dean that may think that here. <laughs> With a multi-million dollar government funded precision medicine initiative currently underway, debate is intensifying over whether this approach to treating disease can truly deliver on the promise to revolutionize healthcare. And then finally, it seems fair to say it will be a very long time before science gets to the point where it can offer individually tailored treatment to the masses, if it ever does. The question is, should it even try? All the precision medicine might make sense for people with certain conditions that are difficult and expensive to treat, such as autoimmune diseases or cystic fibrosis that I mentioned earlier. Critics argue that on the whole, simpler approaches to treating disease are better because they cost less and benefit far more patients. Let's say we find a targeted drug that can lower the risk of diabetes by two thirds, Panis says, the author of the study. It would cost about $150,000 a year per person for that drug if we had it. A simple program focused on diet and exercise will do the same. Lifespan has increased by a doubt a decade in the past 50 years, and none of that gain is related to DNA. It's learning about smoking and diet and exercise. It's the old fashioned stuff. So let me conclude by my point on equipoise. I say right now the scale is still tipped to prevention and prediction using our common sense population approaches. Those are simple, don't smoke. Eat well, be active, keep a healthy body weight, know your numbers for blood pressure, cholesterol, and glucose, and treat them appropriately. And by doing so, we can eliminate now 90% of chronic diseases without precision population health. Thank you. So I will entertain debate or questions. Yes. Thanks. Hi, Donna. Julie Palmer. I know hey, we've, Julie. Yeah. That's nice to meet we've you tried person. to collaborate. Yes. Um, yeah, this was an excellent talk. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I come down a little bit more on our dean's side on this, even though, like you, I'm I love the science of it, and mm -hmm. I'm participating in different, you know, every level of the genomic. But one of my pet peeves is how much money is going to several large companies, you know, Affymetrix and Illumina, especially now Illumina, where when 
scientists like us, especially in, well, cancer and cardiovascular disease, when we put in grant proposals, as much as 50% or more is going for those chips you talked about. Yep. And you know, they started out at um, $400,000 for the first GWAS chips. Now for those same, actually larger arrays, they're $40. The reason they've come down is because each time there was that advance to like whole exome sequencing and then whole genome, they had a new product to put out to the same scientists for on the same populations most of the time so they could sell them that and those have gone down from $4,000 to $1,000 for the whole genome. It, you know, that just really bugs me because I, as you talked and got towards the end, I realized where could that money be spent and it's mm -hmm. what you were talking about if it were for more of these community, in, you know, all sorts of level interventions, trials to try out different interventions, that employs a lot more people to do interesting work. And, uh, you know, but we're talking to, there's, it's the American way, um, not that we're the only country doing this, but to look for this fast and easy solution. So I have, yeah. you know, the only thing I have to offer is for the, all the public health people to keep talking about this, I guess. And the, and the solutions are also in advocacy, Julia. I think that when you think through uh, the return on investment from from the whole genome realm, you know it, it's been said that the the Human Genome Project returned eight dollars to one in terms of business development, lots of Illumina and and Affymetrics money returned eight to one to the American economy. So you have that business side of the equation pushing, um, and the public health side needs to have its story as well. And, and you're right that these big studies generate jobs, but they also um, cost the government in terms of the research support. So we have to advocate for more. I don't know a simple solution. But I think that the reason also is for some reason, this particular administration does not value public health. I think prior administrations did, um, and things get be, kept, keep being cut from the from the public health parts of our budget. So we have to advocate strongly. Hi, Donna Catherine Wang. Um, you made a very uh, specific point about how public health can't put its head in the sand. Yeah. And I think I would like to hear more about what public health could do. Uh, you talked about advocacy here, but it, it's, it sounds like it's still framed as advocacy and pushing back against this train that has left. And I think maybe there's another frame in terms of thinking about how public health could get more invested and collaborate with this train that's left a station versus being left behind. And I'd, I'd, I'd be value your thoughts on sort of what could we do in conjunction with this train that is sort of going, left the gate, and and uh, that isn't just about sort of putting our hands up and saying we don't like the direction it's going. Yeah. So one one low hanging fruit that's possible is, and, and I do think that the the precision medicine initiative and the all of us study is aiming to do this, where we're participants actively contribute their data on diet and exercise and that kind of thing. If we could find ways to push that part, that the environmental part of those investigations, I think we can advocate more from the scientific direction, if that makes sense. So don't abdicate everything to the genetics people. Start pushing that. It's not genes, because our genes have gone through 8,000 generations. It's this four generations of rapid environmental change. And we, in public health, are the right people to answer those questions about environment. So it's just framing it differently. Um, Laura Senior from Northeastern University. I also just wanted to, I, I applaud that point incredibly, like, you know, the gene environment interaction question and all, not just the ambient physical environment, but also the social environment to include things like poverty and housing and 
you know, all the different social vulnerabilities and deprivation. The other thing I think is that we can shine a light on inequalities. And, you know, you alluded to, but you didn't really unpack it in this talk, you know, we know that uptake and reach of these interventions is already vastly unequal across different subgroups of our population, and those health disparities are only going to widen. So that's another really important place where we could contribute to this discussion. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, uh, you know, I, I think my opposition, such as this, to um, precision medicine is overstated. I, I, um, as I've said in many places, I'm a big um, fan of discovery science. My challenge is, you neutralize any challenge I have with your last slide, because I think your sli last slide is perfect. It's exactly the equipoise. And I really like Catherine's question about what we can do. And, and, and I keep being stuck on this issue. It's, um, you know, my first paper on this issue was in um, 2015, right after the announcement, and when it seemed like everything, everything was all about precision medicine. And the challenge was that uh, there was no new investment in anything but these approaches. So what, what, what I struggle with is where does public health fit in here? And, and perhaps an ambitious question is how can we leverage this interest and this momentum in precision public health, which is Nigel Panet's comments, comments was right, I mean, it's a very compelling idea to the ends of improving population health. How, how, how can we leverage it? And I must admit I have not been able to figure it out in my head, but I would love any brainstorm, any thoughts you have on that. I, I do think it's in the answer to the, the last question, which is we have, to, we have to bring what we in public health do best, which is evaluating the environment. And, and by environment, it does include poverty. It does include social determinants of health. And we have to push those questions onto the research agenda of the All of Us program. Now the challenge is we then have a responsibility to go out and making sure all populations are represented in that effort. Because I, I worry, particularly, you know, I'm now in, in Kentucky where we have an Appalachian population that has, of the, the nine counties in the U.S. that saw, saw decreases in life expectancy in the last decade, eight of them are in eastern Kentucky. So they're the most least likely to participate in this. So we have, to, we have a, response, a social moral responsibility to making sure that we get representative populations. But I think you know, when new things get promoted with NIH, the cancer moonshot, uh, the brain initiative, uh, the precision medicine initiative, it was bringing something new to impact scientific discovery. So maybe we have an obligation as public health to say, what is new? What can we bring that would be so big that it deserves its own moonshot? So um, I'm Swanee Jett, um, health commissioner in Brookline and past president of NATO. And so this, this conversation about what can public health do more um, and so I spent probably about six, seven years every year with NATO on Capitol Hill for advocacy. And I've met with the OMB several times. And, and I always said from academia and the practitioner, there's always been a disconnect because the research is developed, but the practitioners don't know how to implement or don't get the evidence-based research. But the bigger issues to the other question that you asked, um, we put all our money into research, and that's what NIH does. And that's in the OMB budget every year. So us as public health in the field have to begin to advocate toward prevention. And so we do need to be in contact with our legislators, work through NATO, ASTO, APHA, and those organizations for that push. Um, especially when you're thinking about, and I remember when Genome Project started years ago, um, I really wanted to focus in on health equity um, and social determinants of health. Um, to me, that's where we should be going, but we have to move toward prevention, and we can't do that if the funding is still going toward research. I don't have a response, Fani. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> All right. Okay, I, I actually have uh, the um, comment to make about uh, what we can do. And uh, when you list uh, um, couldn't agree more that prevention is the way to go. And when we say um, not to smoke, it's very clear when you say eat well, 
it's not very clear. I have known lots of people who think they eat well, and in my opinion, they don't. Uh, what, uh, uh, there are plenty of uh, um, data out there about uh, uh, benefits of uh, whole food plant-based study, healthy whole food plant-based study, but yet uh, it's widely unaccepted and uh, um, people who try to uh, show it, or the data is available are not taken seriously. So this is a huge area that can be explored and help. You know, the I'm whole area stressed. of diet. Now, that's a, it's a complicated area from a, from a statistical perspective and a measurement perspective. And I think that also contributes to the, comp, to the controversies in the field around diet, because they are hard to measure. But we should continue to, to explore and do that work. Well, I'm old enough to remember when tobacco was uh, supposed to be like insufficient evidence for uh, 7,000 studies later and thousands of dollars later where uh, we learned that tobacco is uh, detrimental, but. Yes. Hello, uh, thank you uh, for your talk. It was very, very, uh, interesting and I think uh, very complete but so my question was uh, is uh, I, I'm not so uh, uh, sure if then the conversation should be from from us in public health more towards pushing uh, in research in epigenetics in terms of like moving it a step above just the genome and how all these factors and social determinants that we care about uh, are shaping that expression of those genes. And I, I really wanted to make these questions because I, I think we didn't mention that word so much. And maybe because I think an intended consequence of taking this approach as public health people on, on maybe taking uh, a more careful discussion on precision medicine, we can also be seen as the ones not uh, wanting that progress, but maybe we can be uh, constructive in moving it towards epigenetics and like show we are interested in this path, but just at this other level. So what are the ideas around this? So uh, epigenetics is a field that's looking at uh, above the genome uh, genes that uh, get turned on or turned off um, and create uh, our ability to, to transcribe genes when we need them for particular environmental insults. So it's the perfect intersection of genetics and epidemiology, because there we could find genetic environmental modifiers of that epigenome that we could then intervene on. Um, and I do think, and, and I left it out of my talk today, just uh, focusing on the genomic part of, of uh, the Human Genome Project. And I do think it is an area, like one of the, I know researchers are working in looking at epigenetics to define a, a social methyl ep epigenome. Like, could you create a series of markers that identifies social stress? So I think it's a whole area right for public health. I know there's a lot of interest in that area. I've had a grant in that area for seven years. So I, I think it will, it will continue to grow. Um, the, uh, actually, I don't think um, Dr. Annette knows this, but I just have a paper just was published in the Annual Review of Public Health called Precision Medicine from a Public Health Perspective, where I actually make similar arguments to the ones you made uh, here. Oh, that, was a, that was a terrific talk. Please join me in thanking Dr. Annette.